have this available for the folks that can't make it, that would be great. And I'm going to, I think this should take about um, 30 minutes, I hope, depending on how many questions you have. Um, so again, welcome. My name is Lori Lilly. I'm the executive director of Howard EcoWorks. We're really excited to have you for our uh, event on Saturday. It should be a good time. The purpose of this orientation is so that we can review with you who we are. Um, we can would like to talk about our overall role in Ellicott City and the context for this event, um, both in the past and where we are now. Uh, we want to review the day um, and what we will be doing so that we can all be safe and feel confident in what we are doing and also have fun. And then we'll just end with some uh, other ways that you can get involved with um, Howard EcoWorks and improving our local environment. So Howard EcoWorks is a, a regional force for social and environmental change. We engage and educate the community about environmental sustainability and restoration while creating pathways to green jobs through our workforce development programs the dual mission for both workforce development programming and environmental improvements. Our teams are out in the communities um, all day long, um, building and maintaining different types of environmental projects that help to improve habitat, um, clean stormwater runoff, and um, generally help our, our local natural resources. Our primary client is Howard County government um, and other funders include the Chesapeake Bay Trust and we have a growing social enterprise business, our fee for service work um, that's a direct result of the pandemic and how we are working to be more financially sustainable. Um, my background is in watershed restoration and planning. Um, uh, and ecology, particularly forest ecology. Um, I've been involved in Ellicott City since 2011, um, which predates Howard EcoWorks. Um, Howard EcoWorks began operating in 2017. Um, I've served on a lot of different committees and have been very involved in um, the different aspects of, of watersheds, watershed restoration. Um, and it's very, it's very complicated and I do not want to go into all the details, but I um, want to just give you a little bit of context in terms of um, the effort that we are doing here now is relative to um, what Howard County government is doing to remediate flood, re, re, uh, remediate the floods. We are trying to be a complementary partner as best as we can and to um, uplift the community through grassroots efforts to provide a long-term sustainable voice for the community and those that um, you know, are dealing with the floods. Um, I know this watershed better than any other watershed that I've worked in. And um, it's interesting because of its small size, it's only three and a half square miles in size which from a watershed science perspective would, would say that it would be um, of a size that you can um, implement projects and have measurable results. Um, and that's in 2012 when I, when I developed this watershed plan for the Tiber Hudson watershed was my understanding, um, but it's much more complicated than that. And climate change has really uh, exacerbated um, the problems and um, having been involved through a few of these floods um, with the community and providing support, it's, um, it's really just a complicated issue. So from my perspective, um, I've been seeing this as a case study kind of in how we as a community and as a nonprofit and advocate for change can make a difference in a way that will again, complement the work and the capital projects that the county is putting in the ground 
um, to help the community. In, uh, in 2015, we started a debris management program, which was a direct result of the 2011 flood. And the consultants report that said that debris blockages were one of the contributing factors, one of the major contributing factors to that flood. That a lot of people aren't aware that there was a 2011 flood, but that was uh, pretty impactful to the West End neighborhood in the residential part of town. Um, and that's what um, initiated some of the initial community advocacy for action. Um, so we, we you know, put our green jobs program to work um, to address this issue, which was debris in the streams and trying to keep it out of the areas where the stream is constricted or there are small areas and it um, clogs up the channel and creates overflows onto the streets. Um, and now that has since been institutionalized into what is Howard County government's safe and sound plan, um, of which we are um, a significant part in terms of the management of the debris. And after certain types of rain and wind events, our teams go out and do inspections, um, not just in Ellicott City, but around Howard County at um, high priority areas to do, uh, to look for the debris and to determine if there needs to be some kind of action as a result. We, um, over the past two and a half years, um, ha and we have just completed this campaign, this Ellicott City Soak It Up campaign, which was funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. It was a $155,000 grant that um, enabled us to work with private landowners throughout the watershed to implement projects and to educate the community and um, to really you know, have a, a, a presence in, in the city as in terms of a leadership for um, small, smaller scale implementation actions. We focus specifically on turf grass um, because turf grass is almost like impervious cover. That's your roadways and your rooftops and your uh, sidewalks that shed stormwater um, and create flooding problems. Turf grass is, is almost as bad as those uh, as the roadways in terms of the amount of runoff that it generates. And so again, as being a complementary partner to the government, we um, focused on turf grass and conversion to more permeable landscapes for our uh, Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant. You can see in this graphic, the small root systems that turf grass has compared to the really big root systems that um, our native plants have. Um, and also a lot of our soils in developed areas like where we are in Howard County are very compacted. We also in Howard County have a lot of clay which exacerbates compaction. And so um, that doesn't allow rainwater to soak into the ground. Um, so we, for our grant, we focused on converting turf grass areas into native landscape areas. Um, and so, yeah, we just completed this work in the fall of 2020. Um, again, it's been a long time that we've had this kind of sustained presence in Ellicott City doing community engagement and um, installation of projects. Um, you can see the, the pounds of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and sediment which that were reduced to these projects. That's a metric that Fish and Wildlife Foundation uses to document the success of their work. So our projects are, are, are small, you know, they're not the big flood remediation projects that are gonna solve the flooding problem, but it is a way to engage the community in actions to, um, so that everybody can be a part of the solution. Everybody can hold a little bit of the water on their own ground. Through this same project um, funded by Fish and Wildlife Foundation, we looked at biochar, which is a soil amendment. It's a charcoal based soil amendment that has, uh, it's similar to compost in the way that you use it um, in terms of uh, tilling it into the ground and helping to um, increase infiltration and decrease compaction. 
um, but it lasts in the soil for a much longer period of time than compost. So it, it also is a carbon negative technology, meaning that um, it's, it's great for climate change. You, you, you turn waste materials, any type of organic waste materials, such as wood waste or manure can be turned into biochar and then um, used as a soil amendment to both increase infiltration, but also help improve plant health and help plants grow better. Um, so it has a lot of benefits. And through this project, we worked with the University of Delaware to look at biochar as a soil amendment for uh, runoff reduction in the watershed. And this is a picture of the biochar being installed in the test plots that we had at St. Peter's Church, where some, you know, some of you will be meeting there on Saturday. Um, on the plot on the right is a darker colored soil. That's where the biochar was amended into the soil. And on the left is the control plot where there was no biochar. Um, and the University of Delaware grad students led this work. Um, this is a picture of them doing their infiltration measurements. And they fed, they, we had two sets of test plots, one at St. Peter's Church and one at Slack Funeral Home. And they, they found great results, um, similar to results that they found elsewhere. Um, and there are differences and you see a wide range here, but the infiltration of the stormwater was, was ranging from 36 to more than 220% greater in the biochar amended test plots as the control plots over multiple different sampling times. Um, and then the differences have to do with the soil compositions at both of the sites. Um, but it, it mirrors similar results that the U University of Delaware has found at other, in their other research that they've been doing is bio, with biochar. Um, so I'm bringing this to you to show you um, Again, the overall context, we're wrapping up this work, this big grant project that we had with Fish and Wildlife Foundation that just ended in the fall of 2020. And this is bringing us to, okay, well, what are we gonna do next with Ellicott City? Because we've, we've been engaged with the community for the past two and a half years through this grant and how are we going to maintain a presence? And it, and it can't be at the same level that we have been under this grant because we don't have that sustained level of funding. Um, so that's in part why for the reason for having this event that we're having the Tiber Watershed Makeover. So this event, um, which we we're gonna have hopefully keep as an annual event will be the second event. The first event would have been um, when Gordon Ramsay came to town last year around this time. And um, we wanna build off that momentum in terms of having that really high impact with a lot of volunteers um, out, in the, out in the watershed doing work. Um, but whereas last year with Gordon Ramsay, all the volunteers were concentrated down on Main Street, we really wanna get people up into the watershed. And I, and I tried to get Fox Productions to do that to begin with, but they wanted everybody on Main Street. Um, so this is, this is, um, this is gonna be mo more meaningful work. Um, in terms of the activities that we're gonna be undertaking as a group. And it is a bit of a, a social experiment to see how much impact we can actually have with loads of volunteers that are out in the watershed doing work. Um, and so hope for this to be an annual event and continue to use Ellicott City as a model for watershed restoration and resiliency, but with the power of people um, you know, adding that component as an integral part of, of what we are trying to do. And the work that we're going to be doing on Saturday is focused specifically, or, you know, it, we are going to be cleaning up trash, but we are having um, one of the major goals is to work in the forests and, and um, helping to manage the existing trees. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. So our this is our schedule for the day. We're asking folks to show up at 9.30. So we wanna begin promptly at 10. So if you can arrive at your designated site between 9.30 and 9.45, that would be great. Um, you need to get checked in with your team leader. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of safety now, but if there's any site specific safety um, things that your team leader needs to go over, they're gonna go over that at 9.45 to 10. 
And then at 10 o'clock, we're going to kick off the event with um, County Executive Ball through Facebook Live. And we're going to ask everybody at all of your different sites to tune in through Facebook Live so you can hear us kick off the event. And then from 10 15 to noon, we're going to be working at all of our respective sites. We're going to wrap up at noon. And then some of the local businesses are going to be offering specials that day. And we really highly encourage you to go and support those businesses. The ones that will have specials are the Phoenix, La Palapa, Manor Hill, and Georgia Grace. Um, so far, Manor Hill is the only one that's given us a, a specific special, the, the New Cut Mega Meld. So, um, but hopefully the other ones will um, also chime in with, with their specials before the day of the event. This is a, a map of the watershed on um, the left. It's, it's the white line that you see. Um, a, a watershed is all the area that drains to a common point, just in case anybody doesn't know that. Um, so everything inside the white line drains down to the area called downtown on this map. That would be old Ellicott City. And the Tiber watershed has three sub watersheds, three major tributaries that all meet downtown. That's the Hudson sub watershed, the Tiber sub watershed, and the New Cut sub watershed. So we're going to have 100 volunteers out on um, Saturday, and we're going to be spread out uh, at nine different locations um, re with representation in each of the different sub watersheds. Um, we're going to be working um, mostly on public land, Howard County land, um, and also along the roadways. Um, three, of the, three of our nine sites are going to be led by the Patapsco Heritage Greenway. Um, and if I could just take a moment to have Hannah chime in, who is with the Patapsco Heritage Greenway, she can let you uh, know a little bit about uh, her group. Sure. Thanks, Lily. Um, so my name is Hannah Zinnert. I'm the program manager at Patapsco Heritage Greenway. Um, some of you may have already met me at an event before, but we do a lot of volunteer-based environmental stewardship activities all throughout the Patapsco watershed. Um, so we're active in both Howard and Baltimore County. Um, we do lots of stream cleanups, tree plantings, invasive removals. Um, and we've been a volunteer organization since about the late 90s. And we've been the managing entity of the Patapsco Valley Heritage Area since about 2015. Um, so we're really excited to partner with Howard EcoWorks on this uh, anniversary celebration project. And, and it goes hand in hand with a grant that we received from the Chesapeake Bay Trust in Howard County to uh, get volunteers out in Ellicott City for the upcoming year doing these activities. Um, so that does include the Tiber watershed, but it does also include areas outside of that as well, such as like the Sugar Branch watershed or the Bonnie Branch watershed um, or up in the Daniels area of Patapsco Valley State Park. Um, so yeah, we're just really excited to get out there and we'll be doing a lot more of this for the upcoming year. So thank you. Awesome. Um, we're really grateful to Hannah and her group for helping us uh, with the event because it enables enables us to uh, bring more volunteers. We're, their limitation with volunteers is group size that is in part due to COVID, um, but just uh, how many people one person can manage. So by having Patapsco Heritage Greenway help lead additional teams, we're able to have more volunteers participating um, on Saturday with us. So what we will be doing is um, picking up trash, of course. Um, we are going to be managing invasive vines as one of our major activities. And we're going to be doing sun beautification. Um, and we're going to be sprinkling lupin seeds. Um, so each team will be getting a packet or you know, several packets of lupin seeds to, to spread around their site. And that's going to be kind of our longer term uh, sh showcase for, for what we did today. We're gonna be able to see that in a couple of months. You know, I'm not sure how long it will take them to germinate, maybe, maybe six or eight weeks. We'll be able to see the lupins popping up around in the areas that we worked. Um, in terms of beautification, the picture that you see in the middle top is um, St. Luke's Church. That's at the bottom of Ellicott Mills. That's not what it looks like right now, but I didn't have a picture. Um, that uh, whole hill slope that's in this picture covered in rocks um, completely 
slumped in the 2018 flood and they put all of that rock on there to stabilize it. Since then, the rock has been removed and they installed what we call a conservation landscape. It's um, does have like a structural component and that there's like a grid holding the soil in place, um, but they did a, a big native planting on top of that. It is now um, unfortunately covered in weeds and non-native plants that we really don't want to spread. Um, so one of the, the major beautification project that we're gonna do is at St. Luke's Church because it is the gateway to town. It's like when you're driving down Ellicott Mills and you come into town, that's what you see is St. Luke's Church and that hill slope. So, and that, that church needs support in maintaining that um, particular um, slope and that new garden that's there. So our, we have one team that's there doing that. Um, and a note on lupin seeds and lupin plants is that a uh, fun fact is that they are a nitrogen fixing plant. And so they are able to take nitrogen from the atmosphere and convert it um, in the soil to make it available for plants, which is a, a special superpower that not all plants have. Um, so lupins in particular, they are a native plant, but they have that extra special power of being able to make fertilizer from the air, basically by taking the nitrogen out of the air and converting it to an available form for plants. So they're super cool in that way, in addition to being very pretty. Um, sorry. So for the invasive vines, um, these are, um, a real problem, like uh, not just in Howard County, but in the whole mid-Atlantic and in a lot of areas, we have forests that are being overtaken by various types of invasive vines that are threatening our tree canopy. And it's, it's super important because trees take so long to grow. And if you think about the investment of resources of you know, just solar energy and water that it takes to produce one tree, and then the impact that you can, the negative impact that you can have by not managing these invasive vines, it's really detrimental. Um, the vines are direct competitors um, for light with the trees. So they climb up the trees and then they shade out the trees so that they're not able to get enough light for themselves. Um, in addition, the, the vines, once they get, you know, up into the canopy, they create, um, they make the tree a lot heavier and a lot more susceptible to wind and storm events so that they are more susceptible to falling. Now I have a premature death because these vines have been climbing all, of, all over them. Some of the vines that are like directly attached to the trees can also introduce um, different types of like bacteria and things that um, can um, impact the tree. Um, there's a thing called woods in good condition, which is actually a stormwater management standard by which all of our stormwater is, is referenced against what we call woods in good condition, which is, I find to be fascinating because we don't have very many woods in good condition. So we don't have the reference conditions by which we are measuring and regulating all of our stormwater management. And so I think as a first line of business, tackling our forests and, and helping them to be actual woods in good condition is a really good and important step that's being left out of our watershed management um, process. So we are gonna focus specifically on Oriental bittersweet and English ivy. Um, it's the most dominant um, invasive vines that we have around here in this watershed anyway. Uh, the Oriental Bittersweet, this is some pictures of it. Um, in the winter time, it's very obvious with those red berries with the little yellow sepals. Um, it's great decoration for, for your home in the winter time, but um, this vine is really problematic. Um, it is a strangling vine. You can see it here in this picture. It's strangling itself, wrapping itself around itself um, in order to get up into the canopy. Um, this was this 
uh, vine was native to East Asia and introduced in the 1860s for erosion control. Uh, you can see um, the important part that I want you to get from this is how to identify it, which is that it has these little uh, warts kind of all over it. Um, and it's a free hanging vine. It's not going to be like stuck to the side of the tree like the English ivy. It's going to be hanging off the canopy. Um, so what, what we're going to do is just cut it. Um, we're going to make a couple cuts so that you have a section that's maybe, you know, a foot, foot and a half um, in length um, to, and then, then when you're going to leave the vine hanging in the tree canopy, it's just going to die and it'll, um, yeah, we're just going to leave the vines hanging in the tree. The, the piece that you cut off, it's, um, it's not going to regrow. You can just leave it on the ground. We don't need to take that and put it into a trash bag like the English ivy. Um, so it's pretty easy to take care of. We're just going to use loppers or snips and make a couple cuts of us to make a one to two foot section. Uh, we're not going to dig it out. Um, ideally, we would be digging it out, but because they're, we're prioritizing our work. Um, and the first line of action is just to help kill what is currently invading on the tree and to release the canopy from the weight of the bittersweet. Uh, we do have a video on our YouTube page that you could check out um, that I did a few months ago that shows you um, how to manage the bittersweet. The English ivy um, was as obviously native to Europe. Um, it was introduced in the early 1700s as a ground cover. It's still sold in stores. Um, this, you know, it's hard to see in this picture in the middle, but there is a tree in there that's just completely suffocating from English ivy. You once you, if you're not familiar with this invasive vine after Saturday, you will see it everywhere on all of the trees because now is the time that it's very obvious because it's evergreen. Um, the small, this one grows like actually on the trunk of the tree. Um, the small stems you can like literally pull off, um, but we want to do the same thing where we make like a window cut and uh, we want to do that all around the trunk of the tree. Um, so you can see this happy guy in this picture. Um, I put two little red lines here. We want to cut off a section. Um, if the ivy is all around the tree, and in a lot of cases it will be, we want to make a, a girdle around the whole tree. So a whole section where it's free of ivy. Now, for the bigger vines, they might be, the root hairs from the English ivy might be um, you know, they're growing into the tree and you would need to pry that off with a pry bar or a really strong screwdriver. Um, and then that we want to put into a trash bag and take away because it's still alive and it will re, re sprout. In a very ideal world, we would do, be doing what this lady is doing in this picture down here, which is she's girdled all around the bottom of the tree. And then she's also pulling the ivy away from the base of the tree. Um, for you know, multiple feet so that it doesn't regrow to the top of the tree. Now, you're welcome to do that um, as a priority action. Again, we wanna just, we're focused on saving the tree itself and alleviating the impact directly on the canopy of the tree as our first line of action. Um, secondarily, we can, we can do this extra work, but there, there are so many trees that have the bittersweet and the English ivy on them that if our first line of action can be to just um, mitigate that problem, that's what we're trying to do. Um, and, it, and there's also a video about English ivy removal on our YouTube channel as well. Um, thing to note is uh, the difference between poison ivy and English ivy. Um, they do look pretty similar this time of year. Um, poison ivy is not evergreen, so it doesn't have any leaves right now. English ivy has evergreen leaves, so that's one big indicator. If you see two vines like in these pictures that look pretty similar and there's no leaves on either, then the indicator is the root hairs. And the root hairs of the poison ivy are more of a reddish color and they're denser and thicker and they're covering the whole vine. Whereas with English ivy, you don't have quite as many root hairs on it and they're more of a paler color. Um, 
If you are allergic to poison ivy um, and, you, and you are have a concern, just focus on the bittersweet. And you know, if there's any question, then I would recommend just not bothering with it and focus on the bittersweet. We are asking folks, if possible, to bring your own tools. Um, so 100 volunteers, we, we use the tool bank in Baltimore um, to rent tools and it is a pretty cost effective way of getting a whole bunch of tools to use for an event like this, but we would even still like to limit the cost associated with renting tools uh, from the tool bank for the event. Um, and it also will help to limit um, sharing. So if you have your own tools, then, you know, for COVID reasons, that is best. Um, these are the tools that we're, we're looking for. We definitely would like you to bring your own work gloves. If you have these other tools, such as an orchard saw, which is this top left picture, um, it's kind of more of a rounded uh, saw as opposed to like a bow saw that's straight. Um, it works better with the trees. Um, loppers, pruners, um, some kind of crowbar or pry bar for the English ivy. Um, if you have a safety vest, we will we'll have plenty of safety vests thanks to uh, Patapsco Heritage Greenway. If you wanna bring your own vest, you can bring that. Um, we'll also take donations of trash bags on that on the day of. Um, we would like to know if you have any of these tools and we'll be bringing them to your site so that we can limit how many tools we end up renting from the tool bank. And you can let your team leader know and your team leader should have reached out to you by now. You can also put it into the chat box right now. If you know your site and what tools you have on hand, you can put that into the chat box now and we'll make note of that. Um, we'd like you to wear long pants, um, wear boots if you have them. Um, preferably. Uh, definitely bring your own water. We're not going to have water at the sites. Um, bring your own gloves. Everybody needs to be wearing a mask. Um, if you have your own, we'll have sanitizer at each of the sites, but if you have your own, please bring that. Um, some of these forested areas are quite big. We want you to stay within visible range of all of your teammates. Please don't go wandering off out into the woodlands and we've never seen you again. Um, so stay within, you know, you'll have your vest on. If you can see somebody else with a vest, that, that is what we want. Um, and if you bring in kids, um, we ask the parents to, to please keep track of your children. <laughs> I'm sure you will do that. <laughs> Somebody's saying no. <laughs> um, we do have a rain date, the weather is going to be looking pretty good. So hopefully we don't need to use that. So it should be nice. But the rain date is the following Saturday, March 13th. <clears throat> um, everyone needs to have a ticket. We can't have anybody bringing um, extra volunteers with them. Um, we're keeping the group sizes limited again um, for COVID, but also because one team leader can only manage so many people. Um, so only come if you have a ticket. And of course, don't come if you feel sick. Uh, I think everybody knows that by now, but I have to say it. So um, please stay home if you don't feel well. If you're not gonna make it, we would really like for you to let us know so that we could open up that opportunity to somebody else that would like to volunteer. We do have a wait list of people that would like to participate in the event. So if you can't make it and we can open that for somebody else, that would be great. Um, we would like for uh, all the volunteers to collect photos and videos while you're out there. Um, and we want to compile those into um, a, a little presentation that may be put out on social media or up onto our website. Um, so if you can collect photos while you're out there, that would be great. We would also like if each volunteer could keep track of the number of trees that you manage, like it, an estimate would be fine if you, if you think that you managed 10 trees that day and you could let us know, what we want to be able to report on at the end of the day is that our 100 volunteers uh, managed invasive vines and saved, um, you know, X many trees. If everybody did five with 100 volunteers, that's 500 trees that we saved, which is a pretty significant number. So that's what we want to try to get at. 
Um, you could send your photos and your videos and your reporting to this, this uh, email address, TWM, which is Tiber Watershed Makeover 2021 at howardecoworks.org. And we'll remind you of that again um, later. Um, and if you can, you, you know, if you're on social media and you can post about this, we would also love that. Um, the hashtags that we'll be using are Tiber Watershed Makeover, Tiber Watershed, Soak It Up EC, and Howard EcoWorks. Um, and we can send this presentation out to you also so that you have it for, for future reference. Um, before I go to questions, just a couple other things and ways that you can be involved uh, with Howard EcoWorks and the work that we're doing. Um, we have a, a native plant nursery at the Howard County Department of Corrections, the Seeds of Change Nursery. Um, we are, of course, very in favor of native plants and doing everything we can to uh, eliminate invasive plants. Um, our nursery at the Corrections Department is part of a rehabilitation program for the inmates that are in jail, um, they work with us in the nursery to maintain our plants in our nursery. Um, it, is, it is a really cool effort and the funds that um, from the sales of our plants go back to support our programming and our operation at the corrections department. Um, so we have a storefront on our website uh, where we have some plants for sale right now and we're gonna be adding more throughout the spring. Uh, we also have a new adopt a drain program. Well, it's um, maybe nine months old. This is just in Ellicott City. Um, we received funding, a small grant, $2,000 grant from BG&E to get this started last year and just received another $2,000 grant to keep it going. And the volunteers um, monitor their adopted drains for um, trash and debris and make sure that they're clear this is um, an important maintenance effort that will help to alleviate localized flooding. A clogged storm drain in, in a rain event can be a really big problem. And um, having people out there that are monitoring the drains, county's resources can only go so far. And um, you know, so we're using volunteers to help uh, expand the workforce of the county government by monitoring the drains on this volunteer basis. People go out um, before or after triggering kind of uh, events to make sure that their drains are clear. Uh, we also have opportunities on our marketing committee, our marketing committee chair. Laura is a real go-getter and um, she is always asking uh, us to get more volunteers onto her, our committee. Uh, we have a lot of uh, work to do as a new organization and trying to get the word out about what we're doing and um, we would love to have you involved in that. We also have a, a new rent and eco crew service. Uh, we launched this in 2020. This is a part of our social enterprise development. Um, but if you have landscaping projects um, that don't require design, but you just need some extra labor to help get them in the ground, or you know somebody that could use a little extra help in their yard doing some yard work, you can rent an eco crew to uh, help you get that work done. And we send out two crew members um, that are trained in our safety protocols and in COVID, you know, uh, safety and um, have knowledge of sustainable landscapes and they can help you with your, with your project. Um, and lastly, one of our volunteers, um, Mandy asked that we uh, let you know about Columbia Association's Adopt a Spot program. It's similar to what we're doing here on Saturday. It's focused specifically on Columbia Association lands where they um, are using volunteers to help manage um, invasive species in their open space areas. So uh, that's a program to check out if you are from the Columbia area. So um, I'm going to, that's, that's all. Um, these are two of our crew members, or one crew leader um, and one of our crew members from last year. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to see what kinds of questions have popped up because I saw them um, popping up. Uh, let's see. Maybe there's no questions. All right. 
So uh, do you have any questions? I don't see um, any in the chat box. If you want to unmute and ask a question or you want to put it into the chat box, now would be when will we hear from our team leader? You should have already heard from your team leader. Um, which group are you in, um, Stephanie? If you want to type that in, we'll make sure that your team leader gets in touch with you. Uh, it's the um, school, the um, colored school. Oh, okay. Then I'm your team leader. I emailed oh. everybody um, yesterday or the day before. We. I haven't. Um, could you resend it? I just haven't gotten it. Sure. That I'm aware of. Yes. That'd be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, by when do you need to know what tools we can bring to help you reduce the tool bank order? We would like to know by Thursday. We're going to put in our tool bank order uh, Thursday afternoon and pick them up on Friday. Um, thank you, Al, for bringing um, some tools to the St. Luke's site. Um, so... I guess that's all. Um, we're really looking forward to seeing you guys on Saturday. It's going to be a really fun time. And um, thank you for participating in the project. And uh, we'll see you then. Thank you. <laughs>